The reason fascists and anarchists appear different is because fascists are just anarchists at the reins of state power. So, to recap, the anarchist sees the state as completely meaningless, uh, completely anarchic, representing only the exertion of some arbitrary will over others. Moreover, society is just the sum total of individuals. Now, where does fascism, where does fascism enter into this? Anarchism arises, the general phenomena of anarchism only arises where some kind of stance between the individual on the one hand and society and state on the other hand produces this position of negation. After all, it's that very contradiction that gives rise to anarchism. The state legitimizes itself with law and order and crown and myth. But I'm the anarchist and I know the truth! It's all bullshit! Why is it all bullshit? Because of some kind of contradiction between the way the state justifies itself and the real state. Whatever that may so happen to be. The veneer of civilization and statehood and religion and all the ways it justifies itself and the reality. This contradiction defines the aesthetic of anarchism. There's someone else for whom this aesthetic would prove to be definitive. There's multiple people. The one in particular I want to draw attention to is none other than Adolf Hitler. Again, the world's most infamous and successful anarchist in the history of humanity. But before we get to Hitler, I want to do a very brief genealogy of fascism specifically through the most infamous uh anarchist thinker that everyone it's, it's why it's called bread tube it's why everyone's in it proton now, everybody knows about proton's anti-semitism everyone knows about proton's anti-semitism people usually take the anti-semitism the evidence of Prodown's blatant fascism, yada, yada, yada. But why actually was Prodown a proto-fascist? Why was he a proto-fascist? It has less to do with his uh, Prodown, whatever you call him. Prodhan, whatever the fuck, how you pronounce him. It has more to do yeah, I'm sorry, the bread thing comes from Kropotkin, not Proton. I mixed those up. But he's, he is the formative and decisive influence on what anarchism is. Okay? For that, Proton develops basically this view that in regards to his critique of capitalist, sorry, of society, right, in general, capitalist society, yada, 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 right? For him, there's a lot of things people don't know about Prodham, right? Prodham, people think, was someone who was trying to basically uh, abolish authority, abolish this or abolish that, but this nihilism in regards to politics, in regards to statehood, actually disguised a pretty nasty, a pretty nasty voluntaristic attitude toward how how power should be used. So Prodown was a was a huge militarist. He was a huge racist and militarist who had this poetry of war and the way that war. You know, let me get let me get him in his words. Right? He glorified in a way not dissimilar to the Nietzscheans, people like Wagner or the Wagner. Uh, Enthusiasts afterwards, yada, yada, yada. The way in which they glorified this kind of mythological poetic violence that is the foundation of society and state, particularly through war and the, war, the way in which wars were glorified in the mythic age, 
Proton was all into that kind of stuff, right? So his nihilism of the state was not actually because he was saying, oh, it's just immorality, yada, yada, yada. He's basically trying to set this up in order to fill the vacuum with some extremely obfuscatory, nihilistic, voluntaristic, and mystical understanding of power. I'm trying to get quotes that I want to use, right? Right is with might on whatever side it is found. If might shifts, it shifts too. If might settles here, here also settles right. As long as victory remains the expression of might, it is infallible. When victory is not the expression of might, it has neither consequence nor result. This is how he was understanding uh, the war at his time. So that quote, who is that quote from? Is that from Mussolini? Is that from the Italian futurists? No, that's from Proton. That's, that's from Pierre. That's from the founder of anarchism. The founder of anarchism said some shit. Sounds like it sounds straight out of the mouth of like, you know, Himmler or, or, or Hitler or some kind of shit, right? Doesn't that sound fascist? It's like ad verbatim what they say. But yeah, Proton basically had views about war that were indistinguishable from fascism, okay? I'm going to skip through a lot of shit. But again, the reason why is from the same nihilistic understanding of politics in the state. State isn't based on anything materially real, it's not based on anything objective, it's not based on anything human, it's based on the arbitrary exertion of some wills over other wills. Then furthermore, when you have with the anarchists like Proton, is forerunners to the Italian fascist idea of corporatism. Now corporatism basically refers to this economic notion that the relationship between the civil society and the state will be mediated by corporates. Now, corporates represent these middling institutions between the state and civil society that are economic in nature, that basically provide a supplementary uh, reality and existence to capitalism, to capitalist relations. Corporates are the solid bonds of the society. So, on the one hand, within capitalism, you basically have... I'm going to really come full circle with this, guys, and it's like, we're going to talk about social democracy. It's like, it's going to really make sense. I'm going to really imprint in your mind, irrefutably, like, airtight, Hitler was a fucking anarchist, okay? So, the idea of a corporate, or the notion of a corporate, is basically this parasitical, mediative extra layer on top of capitalist relations that already exist that actually produce things the corporate basically mediates these relations appropriates their products or otherwise oversees the manner by which production over uh, occurs and it's just this extra layer on top of traditional capitalist relations these are the corporates right so marxists on the one hand are perceiving that there are these internal contradictions within capitalism that are giving rise to socialism from capitalism itself. And that Marx's view that when seizing state power through the organ of the state, the essential and strategic means of production are somehow going to be placed under common ownership. And from this will begin overseeing the transition materially from capitalism to socialism right it's not that the state is creating socialism through its nationalizations it's that it is establishing sorry it is unleashing relations of production that are being formed within capitalism itself socialism through the increased socialization of production that happens within capitalism yada 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 so that's the marxist conception of a, of a new society not voluntaristic it's whatever now, Prodhan has a conception where these voluntary associations uh, between producers, industrial and, and, and agricultural federations, this federative structure of these different kind of corporate uh, associations, will basically uh, establish some form of society, some economic society, without any need for a state, on the one hand, or any need for uh, underlying capitalist relations, on the other hand. Now, Prodhan, in his head, 
in his head may be thinking that the state is absent and moreover capitalist relations are absent. But this is just the narrowness of his head. In reality, he is basically in thought imagining something that is on top of reality. Because again, just because you decide capitalist relations shouldn't exist voluntarily doesn't mean they don't continue to exist. Just because you decide the state shouldn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't continue to exist in some kind of way, right? So in your head, you can be thinking one thing, but what you actually mean is something entirely different. What Prodhan basically means is at, like the same thing as fascist corporatism. Same thing as fascist corporatism. Because the thing that Prodhan pr uh, proposes takes for granted the underlying capitalist relations as well as the state that arises as a result of those relations that would make such a thing possible in the first place. Only in fascism is the ideal actually realized. And before we get there, I want to actually trace this. I want to trace this right for you because before we get to Hitler and the Germans, I'm going to talk about Italian fascism because this is the history that they somehow want to cover up to us and they somehow want to make us deny, right? There was a group around the early 1900s. First of all, anarchism was never solidly left-wing in any capacity. And when I say left-wing, I mean like progressive. It was always intermixed with the types of reactionary socialism and yada, yada, yada that Marx was describing in the Communist Manifesto. There was no, like, left or right. There was none of that stuff. There was no, you know, there wasn't this idea of progressivism or anything of that nature. You basically just had, you know, this, this stance towards society and the status quo of negation. We negate everything. We want to abolish everything, yada, 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 right? So this is the anarchist stance. So just as much as the, the anarchists today, they try to whitewash and say, we've always been revolutionary leftists who believed in trans rights. Not true. Equal successors of the anarchist tradition, so-called tradition, and by tradition I'm referring to the patria. So there's different senses that we're using the word anarchism. On the one hand, we're referring to what anarchism actually means in reality. On the other hand, we're referring to a patriarchal tradition, ideological tradition, a thought that begins with Prodhan, right? So in this second sense is what I'm dealing with now. So there was also a right-wing tradition of anarchism, which finds its way into culminating into the uh, Serso Prodhan group. Now the Serso Prodhan group basically adopted Prodhan's ide mutualistic ideas uh, and the syndicalist ideas of the anarchist tradition that we're developing at the time. Because I'm talking about definite traditions here. And it basically um, created this political group. And their basic idea was that through unions, right, through syndicalism, we're basically going to abolish the state. And we're going to abolish the need to even take state power. Because we're just going to have a, a we're going to basically create the embryo for a replacement of the current state through syndicates, right? And this will replace the state power. We're going to bring the whole economy to a standstill and, you know, voluntarily and shockingly and immediately replace all of it. Dramatic, revolutionary change, yada, yada, yada. They're also extremely nationalistic, but so was Prodhan, by the way. Another thing that anarchists like to neglect is that the nation is a material reality. So an anarchist is consistently has to be a nationalist because there's a reality of a nation not reducible to the state. That's why national anarchists believe in like, yeah, we're anarchists, but we're also neo-Nazi racists because races are real and we need to free the racial energy from the state that's keeping it bound, right? So this is another idea that they have. But regardless, right? Uh, one of the members of the Serso Prodhan would be Georges Velois. And Velois would go on to found something called the, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's called the Face, face School, right? It's modeled after Benito Mussolini's fascism. 
and this was in the 20s. So this was France. So here was a direct continuity between the social collectivistic protonism and fascism. You're going to say, Haas, that's a one-off. It's, it's, like, it's not like the syndicalists were a huge force in France. It's not like they were huge in Spain. It's not like they, the synarchists were a big thing in France as well. All of these things are coincidences, right? Well, on the other hand, you have the individualistic uh, interpretations of Proton's ideas. And within these individualistic ideas, which I guess comes from more sterner, sternerite interpretation of Proton, you basically have people who would be formative in the development of Italian fascism, like um, Massimo Rocca. Massimo Rocca. Now, Messino Rocca was an anarchist within Italy. He had a friend named Mario Guoda, who was also in league with him. And at the outset of World War I, they decided that they were going to be pro-war, right? And there was a very smooth continuity between their anarchism, their anarchistic ideas, and their adoption and formation uh, of Mussolini's fascist party. The, also, it's not to mention the influence anarchism posed for the Italian futurists, who would be like this cultural and aesthetic uh, foundation of fascism as well. Fascists like Leandro Arpinati would actually come to prominence having originated as the followers of Rocca and the anarchist movement. And he became Mussolini's number two guy. So it wasn't some one-off case. This is Mussolini's number two guy has origins as an anarchist. I'm just talking purely on an intellectual level just to show you and prove to you the roots of these things, right? More or less, almost all currents of anarchism in Europe at the time culminated in what we call fascism. Fascism was the culmination. It was the evolution. Now, how do you explain that continuity? I'll get to that, right? In works like The Intellectual Origins of Fascism by G.A. Borghese, which was published November 1934 in some social research journal, right? Observers would, would make the connection very early on, right? Um, you know, for example, they would say things like, Fascism takes equitability into account and not contradictorily at all. Both extremes of the post-romantic disintegration the super-individualistic, anarchic, solipsistic extreme and the reactionary obscurantist heard like opposite. So even in this journal, they're able to point out how this hyper-anarchistic individualism, on the one hand, this solipsism, and on the other hand, this sheep-like tyranny over the masses, they're perfectly reconcilable and they're unified in fascism, right? They're two sides of the same coin. This is like when people, when I said Hitler was an anarchist, like, how is Hitler an anarchist? I associate Hitler with authoritarianism and violence and all this kind of stuff. Well, that is just the other side to the coin of his whimsical, hyper-individualistic, voluntaristic, and arbitrary notion of what state power is. Uh, continuing, Mussolini, I'm quoting the same journal, Mussolini was an anarchist and an artist. Endowed, no doubt, with an exceptional and exceptionally well-trained ability for handling passions. He shared also the natural inclination that such ability usually carries with it the inclination to prefer passions easier to handle. Why was he describing Mussolini as an anarchist? Because Mussolini, again, had a view of the state. It was the arbitrary exercise of the individual will. So this also comes with it a view of the state where in the exercising of this will, when you're not yet in state power, it's going to position you as an anarchist. You're abolishing the state subjectively in your practice, supposedly, but that also means the most naked and shameless tyranny of the state. Mussolini did not obey the law and order of his time. He didn't respect the law and order. He didn't respect state and its traditions and its customs he was an anarchist he proceeded according to his own individual will now as a final bonus before i get into the real analysis of anarchism you know beyond all of this direct kind of genealogical tracing of its traditions 
Uh, I also want to point out people like... I just want to point out the general relationship between ultra-leftism and fascism as well. So, when I was reading the letters, which seemed like they were fabricated, but nonetheless reflected the Nazi views of the Soviet Union, in the German soldiers' writings to their loved ones from the Soviet Union, I want to give you a quote that's going to really express well the Nazi attitude toward the Soviet Union. They were either told that within the borders of the Soviet Union, there was a workers' paradise, the true home of the workers of the world, but when the National Socialist newspapers and books spoke of the social betrayal in the Soviet Union, so I'm just going to end it there, at that part. Huh, wait a second, what do you mean social betrayal? Well, what he's referring to is, is um, something I think Himmler, I forgot who, talked about it in the late 20s, that... In the Soviet Union, there was a social betrayal of the working class. The state usurped power from the workers and sold them out, basically, in favor of the peasants and in favor of industrialization. And the Nazis would peddle the same exact line. Then you have the traitor and uh, guy who would basically form the Italian Social Republic, Niccolo, what the fuck is his name? Niccolo Bombacci who would basically say things like, Stalin will not create true socialism, Mussolini will. So what do all these things mean, right, specifically within those contexts? I want to actually emphasize that fascism is a phenomena, like anarchism and all other forms of ultra-leftism, of the urban, lumpen, petty bourgeoisie, or the lumpen proletariat, whatever you want to call it. It's the urban lumpen. It's an ideology of the urban lumpen. It takes the rationalism, modernism, and metaphysics of classical modernity, which found representation and which found realization in the urban centers of Europe at the time, it takes this as its starting point and its ending point. It begins its um, campaign for revolutionary overthrow of all society from the urban center. It sets up the urban center as the realization of true universality, whereas all particularity manifesting itself within the countryside or outside of the metropole and colonies or in um, the Slavic East represents basically some kind of meaningless, meaningless subhuman reality. Uh, or, um, in the case of the Nazis, some kind of like source of mystical obfuscation case of like blood and soil and all this mythological bullshitting and so on so fascism nazism anarchism trotskyism ultra leftism we are talking about and also social democracy within proper context we are pretty much talking about the same thing we are talking about the psychosis of classical modernity and of liberalism manifesting itself as the tyranny of the town over the country these are shared in common. And the sentiment, the sentiment of fascists and Nazis toward the Soviet Union was the same sentiment of Trotskyism, ultra-leftists, and anarchism. Uh, pointing out the hypocrisy of the Bolsheviks and the Soviets. Where, where, where they saw hypocrisy, the Soviets were, they were expressing the dialectic wisdom of the immortal science of Marxism-Leninism. Them, it's dialectics. For the retards, it's hypocrisy and it's a contradiction. Notice, for example, there's a guy, many third positionist intellectual LARPers, fascists, one of those names is Zoltanius, they write polemics against me, talking about, ah, there's so many contradictions in your worldview about Stalin being a Marxist. And the arguments are the same thing as what anarchists and ultra-leftists say. Left comms, anarchists, it's all the same thing. It's the same type of consciousness, right? So I want you to keep that in the back of your head. Now, to give you an illustration, an idea of Nazism generally, I want to take us to the anthem of the Nazi party, which was the Horst Wessel lead, right? It's the song about Horst Wessel. Horst Wessel was a fucking pervert, a pimp, and some chicken shit guy who started kind of cross-dressing, so to speak, 
LARPing to for it's the same kind of thing, perversely LARPing because of the thrill of it, right? The twenties in particular. So Horst Wessel within the twenties would join all sorts of these kind of right wing paramilitary groups. And these groups in the Weimar Republic of the 20s were anarchist groups, all intents and purposes. Now, they may not have shared the ideological doctrine of anarchism, but they behaved and acted, positioned themselves to society in the exact same way as like a fucking punk rock anarchist would. Uh, in particular, the Viking League, right? So this group, the Viking League, uh, Horst Wessel would say that he joined the Viking League for the adventure of it, for the thrill of it, right? The Viking League was basically these street thugs that would go and just fight people and battle people and do illegal shit and criminal shit. Think of like Antifa or the Black Bloc or something like that. That's what we're dealing with, right? The Viking League. But they just, they had a right-wing flavor to it, but the flavor doesn't matter if it's literally the same thing as anarchists, right? So it's the same adventurism and voluntarism and anarchists. Anarchism. And then later, the SA would play the exact same role for people like Horst Wessel, who are these lumpen scum of society who wanted to exercise their criminal antisocial behavior in some kind of way. So they would join the SA. They would join these terrorist groups. They would join these adventuristic, perverse groups that would allow them to realize they wanted so the rank and file of fascism historically was the same uh, as anarchists anarchism right that's some crucial context i want to give you as well what do what do i really mean when i'm associating fascism with anarchism if you remember what i said just on the economic level about how prodham intellectually laid the foundations for fascist corporatism you have a, a, a clear pattern we're witnessing, right? Fascism seems to be some kind of supplementary excess to liberal bourgeois society. It does not actually get engaged in a root and stem revolutionary transformation of the state. There is a profound level of continuity between the bourgeois state and the fascist state. The main thing different with fascism is that fascism is an excess over and above it. It's this extra thing on top. In political terms, the extra thing is political dictatorship. The use of police, paramilitary, extra-legal, dictatorial, and emergency powers uh, in order to arbitrarily engage in this obscene criminal terrorism against society. In economic terms, it manifests itself in the form of corporatism. Corporatism uh, being, having its origins in anarchist syndicalism, in anarcho-syndicalism. So what is this excess we're dealing with? What gives rise to this excess? It's the same thing that gives rise to anarchism, because it is anarchism. The excess in question is the internal contradictions within the liberal bourgeois state. These contradictions basically are between the form of the universal liberal state within classical modernity and its real origins, its reality, its actual existence. This contradiction is the object of both fascist and anarchistic aesthetics. It's just that they cope about it in different ways. Anarchists pretend that they're saying, we need to abolish the state. Anarchists say, yes, you're right about the state. Uh, and this is why we do need to abolish the state. The liberal bourgeois state. But the abolition means something that the anarchists of today don't quite understand. Abolition of the state means... Fully exercise this excess dictatorial power, uh, this obscene criminal supplement of state power, nakedly, shamelessly, and brutally out in the open, this arbitrary exercise of pure political power, criminally, right? With no regard for its legality, no regard for its grounding in civil society, no regard for its grounding in any definite institution, no regard 
for any historical tradition. This excess is the object of both anarchism and fascism alike. Fascists also abolish the state. They just abolish it in a way the anarchists couldn't even dream of. Because when the, when the fascist abolishes the state, they abolish the form of the state. Namely, the form that guarantees the minimum of the civil liberties that allow the state to have the minimum of some kind of grounding in some human civil society reality. The fascists abolish this, they suspend this, and all that remains at the very top is this criminal excess, which they exercise over the whole of society. Anarchists literally do the same thing. The reason fascists and anarchists appear different is because fascists are just anarchists at the reins of state power. They abolish the state, and for all intents and purposes, they suspend the law, they suspend the state, and engage in this anarchic exercise of power. Anarchists may say, oh, Hitler wasn't an anarchist, Mussolini wasn't an anarchist, but that's just because they're not at the reins of power. If you put any one of these fucking anarchists from the book fair at the reins of power, they will be Hitler. Hitler doesn't mean strict traditional order. Hitler means we're going to suspend any strict tradition, we're going to suspend any real order, and replace it with the criminal, anarchic power of uh, the open dictatorship, as they would put it, of the will, of the individual will. So you see, you should start to begin to get an idea of what I actually mean when I say Hitler was an anarchist. Hitler was an anarchist because he disguised what was actually the criminal excess of the bourgeois state itself with some kind of revolutionary overthrow and abolition. Both the anarchists and the fascists think that they're abolishing the state. And from the fascist perspective, they're abolishing bourgeois liberal democracy. From the anarchist perspective, they're abolishing the state as such. The difference is not important because when anarchists say the state as such, they're setting up a false generality. What they mean in actual reality is the state that actually fucking exists, which is the bourgeois state. You, don't, you can't speak for all states for all time and all realities. It's definite particular states that you can actually relate to. Otherwise, you're setting up a fake abstraction. Fascists claim that they're, they're, they're ushering in a new order. Anarchists also claim they're engaging in this revolution. But all they're doing is giving expression to the criminally constitutive violence of state power in class society, and in bourgeois society in particular. The bourgeois state pretends to be based in the form of the law, the rule of the law, the universal equality of the citizen before the rule of the law and the republic. But in reality, the criminal excess constitutive of this state rears its head when the form of the law enters into contradiction with the content of the people over which it exercises power, specifically in the form of the proletariat, which Marx said was the object of all reality and of thought, the truth of reality. And it's not that the human content is too much and too wealthy for the state to account for as an, abstract, as an abstraction, it's just that the actual reality of the people realizes the objectivity of the state in a way that the state cannot account for formally. It is this contradiction between form and content that is the object of anarchism and fascism alike. Both of them respond to this by saying, the contradiction between the form of the state and the reality of the state basically means that the reality of the state has, is reducible to the negation of these forms. Fascism negates these forms through its brutal, open, dicta dictatorial exercise of power. Anarchists try to negate these forms through illegal, criminal, whatever lumpen bullshit activity. But they are one and the same thing. They are one and the same thing. One is at the reins of power. The other is just a generality expressed wherever. Anarchists Fascists, Nazis are the hired thugs of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie needs to address 
this contradiction in some kind of way. It cannot do so without imperiling its own class through a new social revolution and a new revolution in the forces of production, which will render superfluous the rule of the monopolists. So what does the bourgeoisie do? They put men in masks like the Klan, like the Black Legion in the 30s, like the Nazis, like the SA, and like anarchists and like Antifa and like Black Bloc to do their dirty fucking work that cannot be accounted for by the overt and legal forms of the state. And they mobilize this criminal element in order to dispense with the working class. Because for the bourgeoisie, the proletariat is the ultimate criminal existence. And why do they condemn the proletariat as criminal? They condemn the proletariat as criminal because the proletariat in its actual reality cannot be assailed by its empty negative form. It demands particularity. It demands a particular state. It demands a civilizational state. It demands a people state that reflects the character of the people that reflects the character of the civilization, that reflects back to them their real substantive history and real substantive reality. That's the criminal crime of the proletariat in the eyes of the bourgeoisie. So in order to dispense with this ultimate crime, the bourgeoisie employs these criminal lumpen scum, even though the proletariat are in the light of day, they're in the light of day in before the whole people playing by the book. The bourgeoisie employs this lumpen criminal element in order to safeguard its parasitical and monopoly power over the whole of the people. Anarchists, Nazis, fascists, they're all the same fucking thing. They are all the same fucking thing. Yup. The financial aristocracy is nothing but the rebirth of the lumpen proletariat at the heights of bourgeois society. Absolutely. The lumpen is key here. Because what is the lumpen? The lumpen is the realized criminality. The realized contradiction and realized psychosis and madness and breakdown of the bourgeois order. Of the capitalist bourgeois liberal order. The lumpen scum, these disgusting scum, these dregs, realize the madness of bourgeois society, these degenerate scum, and terrorize the good people, terrorize the working class, and terrorize the proletariat, who want to go on with some semblance of humanity, some semblance of normality, and yes, some semblance of real order. Real order, which both fascists and anarchists oppose. Yes, exactly. Criminal mercenaries for the bourgeoisie. The lumpen scum that were employed by the CIA and the State Department and the Department of Defense during the Cold War to go to these African countries, to go to Latin America. They're all criminal lumpen scum who are mercenaries of the parasitical imperialist monopoly bourgeoisie. The hero of the anarchist, the hero of the fascist. Hitler was an anarchist. Hitler didn't represent some authentic tradition of German statehood. Stalin pointed this out. He didn't reflect some true patriarchal tradition of the German state. There was no continuity between any German monarchy and Hitler. He came from fucking nowhere. The expression and triumph of the pure will. And represented the anarchy, anarchic criminal excess of the bourgeois state. Hitler was an anarchist. Yeah, just like confessions of an economic hitman, yep, the free cops also engaged in anarchistic, anarchistic violence. But the retard midwit comes to me and he says, Hans, Hitler didn't overtly subscribe to the doctrine. There's no doctrine of anarchism. It's a fucking cultural trend. And I'll prove it to you. What the fuck is anarchism, ladies and gentlemen, in the most contemporary sense? It's punk rock. It's the punk rock subculture. What is the punk rock subculture? It's a lumpen subculture where both anarchists 
and neo-Nazis, same thing. For the same reasons, for the same rebellion against society. We're going to adopt the swastika, the, the most uh, offensive thing ever. Same punk rock shit. It's a soft power Anglo-American export. 